But at this time, we're going to ask that um, your wife to come and read the scripture today. And she's going to lead us in prayer. And then we're going to come back with the word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning. Amen. Hopefully you all have had a blessed week. Um, I'll be reading from um, Mark, the sixth chapter. And it reads, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazarene, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogues and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick folk people and heal them. And he was amazed at the unbelief. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you, God, once again, God, for another wonderful day, God. Thank you, God, for touching us and allowing us to rise out of our bed, God, and allowing us to have our bed to rise out of, God. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word that will go forth, God. We pray that it will fall on the ground, God, and that it will take root and just to grow in the hearts of your people, God. God, we pray that you will give us strength, God, to continue to overcome and to continue to go through this coronavirus, God, that's affecting our world today, God. And we just we just praise you, God, and we just accept your your will for our lives, God. And we just want to trust you, God, through it all, God. We're going to lay it all at your feet and trust you, God. God, we just want to say thank you. We praise you. We adore you. We magnify you. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. It's in the mighty son of your Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, God. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Nelson, and we praise God as we are listening to a little bit of that music. There's something happens when we call on the name of Jesus. We're going to get into the word now. And uh, a word's going to come exactly out of that particular passage of scripture in Mark, the uh, sixth chapter. And I just want to uh, reemphasize and reiterate uh, verse three and four says, then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, speaking of Jesus, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. I we'll also ask my wife to look up James, the fourth chapter, letter verses of that shortly, and I'm going to be turning there. But uh, I want us to look at this passage, and I want us to think about this passage again, where as Jesus returns back to his hometown, and it says when he returned, he left as a carpenter. He comes back as a rabbi. You got to understand that. And he comes back not only as a rabbi or as a teacher, but he also comes back with disciples. And those people who were most familiar with him or who knew him as he was growing up in life, uh, they began to scoff at him and begin to make mockery of him and begin to ask questions. Who does he think he is? And so when I looked at this passage of scripture, the Lord gave me a word for today for us. And uh, just going to read that verse four again. Then Jesus told them a prophet is not uh, without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And I want you to notice this last part. And because of their unbelief, he could not do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Imagine that Jesus Christ was limited to what he could do because of people's unbelief. I want to talk to you today from this thought. Don't take it for granted. Amen. Don't take it for granted. Let me begin by sharing with you a true story. About 10 or 15 years ago, I remember attending a funeral here in the city of Louisville, Kentucky, where a particular family was suffering quite severely as they assembled 
uh, to celebrate the life and the legacy of a man who had been quite instrumental in leading his family and quite influential in the community in which he grew up. I noticed that after the family was seated, the funeral directors began to close the casket and just as one of the directors was turning the key to the casket, a young lady rushed out of her seat, falling prostrate on the casket and crying, screaming and wailing at the top of her lungs, daddy, come back. She kept crying that daddy, come back, daddy, come back. I am so sorry, please, daddy, come back. And then she says, I promise I will change. Daddy, I'm so sorry, please come back. I promise, I promise, I promise. And there was this young lady crying on this casket, holding onto a casket, praying and crying and wailing and screaming and asking her daddy who was deceased now to please come back. And if he did, she would make it right. And as I sat in the pulpit of the particular church that I was attending for that funeral, the thought went through my mind, she's waited too late. She had literally taken her dad for granted. Not only had she taken her dad for granted, but she had also taken time for granted because it's obvious that she felt she had time to reconcile and then time caught her by surprise. And I wonder my brothers and sisters, how many of us have been guilty of making the terrible and tragic mistake of taking people, possessions, and even the person of God in Christ for granted in our lives. Too often we have a tendency like these people in the text to grow familiar with certain people. And as a result of our familiarity, we have a tendency to take them for granted. Bible tells us in this particular text that Jesus had returned home and he was now among his kinfolk and among his neighbors that he grew up with. When they saw him, and they noticed that he was now doing miracles and they saw him with followers and they saw him doing these miraculous things that he had been sent to do as a part of his mission because they knew him growing up. The Bible says that they begin to scoff at him and, and ask questions like, who does he think he is? And they begin to show that because of what they thought they knew about him, they took Jesus for granted. Write this down because God gave me this. Uh, for us, and I want you to write this down, but too often in life, we fail to value what we have until we no longer have what we fail to value. I'm going to say that again. Too often in life, you and I as human beings are guilty of oftentimes devaluing what God has given us by way of family, friends, finances, and the things of this world and we have a tendency to not value them until we no longer have them. Now you've heard some people say you never miss your water until your well runs dry. How true it is that as a result of our human tendencies to take God and people and life for granted, so often we find ourselves like that young lady clinging into that casket when it's too late, crying about the fact that if we had another chance, we would do it all over again. So I want to talk to you today about the importance of not taking life for granted. I thought about this time that we're experiencing this pandemic and all the things that are going on. And I thought about all the things that people are now wishing they had the opportunity to do again. There are three spirits that I want to share with you and I God gave me this message that there are three spirits are attitudes that are always exhibited whenever someone or something is being taken for granted. Three, three spirits are three attitudes that people display or exhibit when they're taking someone or something for granted. And so, and right there in verse three, I want you to look at that because we're going to walk through this if the Lord will and we'll be done in a little bit. But in verse three, 
Notice it says this, it says in the verse two, it says the next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed at his ability to teach so well. And they asked, where did he get all this wisdom? Because Jesus hadn't attended any seminary. He didn't come up under any rabbi to be taught. So they said, they asked the question, where did he get this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? And I've learned in life that a lot of people who say they believe in God doesn't necessarily believe that God anoints certain people. Then they scoffed at him and they begin to say these words. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary. And that was to be uh, to ridicule who Mary was because evidently Joseph had died. He's not mentioned. And so they were speaking in an illicit manner about his mother, Mary. He's the brother, James, Joseph, Judah, Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Now watch this. The three spirits are attitudes that are always present or that are always exhibited when someone is taking someone else or something for granted. The first spirit I want to talk about is the spirit of criticism. The spirit of criticism. When people take God, when people take others, family members, spouses, children, whatever it is in life, the spirit of criticism is one of those spirits or attitudes that are always present and prevalent in the lives of those who take things for granted. Right there, it's right there in the text because it says they scoffed at him. You see, the spirit of criticism means, means is, is when people take a personal analysis or judgment of you and based on what they see you as or how they want to make you see yourself. Let me say that again. The spirit of criticism is when people take a personal analysis of our judgment of you based on how they see you. So, so when people criticize you, oftentimes it's because they don't see you in the created format and in the created blessing that God has created you in. They, they see you from a perspective that they have formed about you in their own minds and in their own lives. And then criticism has the tendency to scoff at you with the hopes of making you see yourself as they see you. Amen. The only way some people can make themselves feel big or feel good about themselves is by attempting to make someone else feel small. There's a lot of people who criticize other people, not because there's anything wrong with the people that are they're criticizing, but simply because they're small minded. And small-minded people have a tendency to try to speak negatively about somebody else so that they can feel big within themselves. Come on, y'all. Yeah, some of y'all know some of those kind of folks. And, and as a result of their own insecurities, as a result of their own jealousies, as a result of their own enviness, they have a tendency to speak negatively about somebody else. Because in a lot of cases, I've learned that a lot of people who criticize you, they don't criticize you because they really look down on you. They criticize you because they wish they were you and they wish that God would favor them like God is favoring you. Don't ever let nobody talk you out of the favor that God has placed upon your life. Don't ever allow nobody to criticize you to the point to where you start feeling down because they, they separated themselves from you and you start feeling down like you're a nobody. God didn't create you as a nobody. You're somebody. You're made in the image of God and after his likeness. And you should always see yourself from the lens of God's eye, not man's eyes. Always see yourself from the lens of God's eye. Not necessarily from how everybody else sees you. Amen. I remember uh, one late preacher, uh, Dr. F.G. Sampson, who said one time, I think his daughter was named Alfreda, and said she came running home. And said she came running home and she said, Daddy, Daddy, this boy said that I, I'm really good looking. He says, uh, okay. And she says, uh, I'm just excited because he says uh, I'm beautiful. He said, well, go back and tell him, thank God he got good eyes. See, see you should never allow him. You should always see yourself in the perspective that God sees you in. Amen. And so, and so one of the spirits that are always prevalent, that's always present, that's always going to be exhibited when people take you or when people take God or when people take anything for granted, there's always that spirit of criticism. 
always scoffing at something, always talking down about something, always angry about something. And watch this. I looked up the word criticism, and I want to read this to you. It says, criticism is usually done as an attack or expressed by someone who is jealous or angry at you and who desires to harm you by the words to someone else or about you. Now, watch this. It, sa it says, criticism is usually done as an attack as an express by someone who is literally jealous or angry at you. And what they do is they attack you so that they can harm you by their words before somebody else. And so when these people saw Jesus come back and they saw what God was using them to do and the miracles that he had wrought, the people who were most familiar with him begin to scoff at him, begin to criticize him. And say things like, well, who do he think he is? I mean, we know him. We know his mama. We know his brethren. We know his sisters. I mean, they've been in this neighborhood all our lives. And, and so so who is he to come back now? And who gave him this wisdom? What school did he go to? Who elevated him to be a rabbi? Who, who gave him the authority to be able to stand and talk about the God of creation? And, and can't you see people like that today? When, when God elevates you, out of their anger, out of their jealousy, they begin to scoff you. They begin to talk down about you to somebody else. But don't you ever change your position simply because other people don't have the right perception of who you are. You don't, you don't ever give up on life because people have bad eyesight. Because what God ought to do, what God does through his word, God gives you insight despite people's bad eyesight. And you ought to have insight to the word of God and to the will of God about your own life and come to the realization that if God has lifted you up, if God has elevated you, can't nobody shut that door. Can't nobody bring you back down but yourself. I've learned one thing about the devil. The devil understands that the only way that we can, that, that he can get God to stop blessing us is by causing us to walk in unbelief. Because remember the text, the Bible says, that Jesus could not do many miracles among them except heal a few sick folk, which means he went there with the intention of healing everybody. He went there with the intention of being for, for doing for doing great and mighty works. In fact, the Bible said he, he couldn't do many mighty works. So he just did a few small things simply because people did not believe. And when we fail to believe God, when we fail to trust God, when we fail to put our confidence in God, we minimize the potential and the possibilities that God has placed before us. Simply because we're seeing ourselves in a light that God doesn't view us in. The Bible says they begin to criticize him. They scoffed, saying he's just a carpenter. Look at him. All he is is a carpenter. All he does is work with wood and stones. But sometimes, sometimes you have to ask yourself, why was... Why did Jesus come or grow up as a carpenter? And one commentator suggested that it's possible because he came into this world to be a builder. He came to rebuild us. He came to redevelop us. He came to, to reconstruct us so that we can go back to Genesis 1.26. And as God created us in his image and after his likeness, to refashion, to remake and to reform us to be what God originally intended us to be. I thank God that he came as a carpenter. But he's not just a carpenter in the physical realm, or was. He's a carpenter in the spiritual realm. Because in Luke 18 and 1, 18, 4 and 18, the Bible talks about he, he was, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And he was anointed to bring the gospel to the poor, to, to release those who have been captive, to, to break the yokes of those. So, so Jesus is a carpenter. He, he literally came by way of, uh, uh, of the cross to help build us and to restore us and to redeem us uh, uh, by the blood that was shed on that cross, by him being buried and by being risen on that third day. He literally came to build us again. They took him for granted. And because they took him for granted, they missed out on the miracles and the mighty works that could have been theirs had they not taken Jesus for granted. So often in life, as a result of those who take people for granted, they have the spirit of criticism. But there's another spirit that's often 
exhibit it when people take you for granted. And not only is it the spirit of criticism, but it's the spirit of complaining. The spirit of complaining. See, criticism is when they scoffed at him. Complaining is when they became irritated at him. You see, the spirit of complaining, our complaining is to be negatively dissatisfied, unhappy, and always murmuring about something that irritates them. When I thought about this, I thought about how all of us are guilty of this spirit of complaining. All of us have been guilty of complaining about something we should have been grateful for. All of us are guilty of complaining about things that we have taken for granted. All of us are guilty about complaining about people that God has placed in our lives and we've literally taken them for granted. All of us have even been guilty of complaining against God and taking his blessings and his grace and his mercy for granted. I thought about this thing and I thought about this pandemic and I thought about having so many people used to complain about having to go to work. Now you got people protesting to go back to work. See, 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 you got to be careful about what you what you complain about and about taking life for granted because within a moment's notice, everything you complain about could be gone. There are people across this globe, it's thousands of people, thousands of lives have been snuffed out as a result of this pandemic. And I'm sure among those thousands and thousands of people across the globe and the thousands within this country, there are some people who have passed away. And just like that young lady that prostrated herself on that casket, some of them never got to say goodbye. Some of them never had the opportunity or took the advantage of loving those that they had a chance to love when they were here. Why? Because they took them for granted. And too often, we take our relationships for granted. We just assume they're going to be okay. We just assume they're going to be there tomorrow. We just assume it's going to work out. We take our marriages for granted. Isn't it amazing how when we first meet, everything is always lovey-dovey? Everything that they don't make, that, that other person never makes a mistake. But once we become familiar with them, then all of a sudden we begin to complain. About everything. Amen. Some of, you, some of you all are guilty about that as well. Just say amen. When, when, when you met that person, when you first met them, they had they had some things about them that literally annoyed you and, and irritated you. And when they did it, they said, I'm sorry. Like, they don't bother me. They don't bother me. They don't like they bother me. But that's during the dating game. Then when it gets down to that marriage part in months or years down the road, and those same tendencies begin to show up we have a tendency to become irritated and complain about the things that we should be grateful for. Amen. Amen. That, that we, we complain about our relationships. We complain about our families, our friends, and even our enemies. We have a tendency to fail to realize. And then we have a, the audacity to quote uh, uh, Romans 8 and 28, all things are working together for my good because I love the Lord and I'm the call upon this purpose. And as soon as something goes uh, against the, what we desire, we have a tendency to complain. But what happened to Romans 8 and 28? You said all things were working together for your good. We, we talk about this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, what is your it? Because your it could be where somebody's treating you wrong. Yo, it could be an argument with your spouse. Yo, it could be no finances in the bank. Yo, it could be a sickness in your body. And then you got the audacity to say in a pulpit or in a church setting, in a sanctuary, this is the day. But what about when your it shows up? He said, this is the day. Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whatever the it is of that day. He says, rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because that's when it's tied to Romans 8, 28. When you understand by the providence of God, all things are working together for your good. Yeah. It may hurt, but it's working for your good. Yeah. You may not like it, but it's working for your good. Yeah. It may bother you, but it's working for your good. Quit complaining and quit taking life for granted and learn to say thank you through all things. You, Lord, I don't understand it, but I thank you. I don't like it, but I thank you. I don't want to feel this pain, but I thank you because I know it's going to work out for the good. 
Don't, don't, don't complain. Because what you complain about too often, God has a tendency to take away from you. We sit around talking about, I got to get up and go to my, it's Monday morning. Now folk are walking through the neighborhoods early on Monday morning just to get out of the house. Be careful what you complain about. We complain about the rain. We complain about when it's sun shining. We complain about when the wind is blowing too hard. We complain about food. We complain about, I mean, we complain about everything. Literally just people just complain. We complain about the seasons. I don't like the winter. I don't like the spring. I don't like the fall. I don't like, I mean, I mean, I, it's too hot in the summer. I mean, here it is. I mean, we, we just go through these series of complaining. And we sit there and be three degrees in the wintertime and we're like, I can't wait till summer get here. Then summer gets here. It's too hot. It's 90 degrees outside. I ain't going outside. Don't take life for granted. We just complain about everything. People have, used to complain about these uh, waitresses and waiters in the restaurants. Now they can't get to the restaurant. <laughs> you got people who say, in fact, I, I hope my wife don't mind me sharing this, but uh, you know, she's the early riser. She got up this morning and at 7.10, I looked at my clock. 7.10, she had all of her clothes on. I said, are you going to 8 o'clock service or something? I mean, we don't have service at 10.30, amen. And she said these words. She said, when the doors open, I'm going to be there at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and all day long if they say that. You know why? Because we now miss what we took for granted. She's not the only one. We're all like that. Many of us, you complain, I ain't going back to Sarah. All these uh, two hours, all day long, I got to do this. I mean, God has allowed us to take the, I mean, he's taking the sports away. Everything that we held as idols and, and, and that distracted us and took our attention off of him, it's been gone and taken away. That's because we took God for granted. We take for granted the privilege that God gives us up every morning. I know we go through our rituals of praying, but we often take for granted that every breath we breathe is to be valued. Every, every step we take is to be valued. Don't, don't take for granted as if you just know tomorrow is going to show up. In fact, James in the fourth chapter of James, the Bible tells us that James says our lives are like a vapor. I mean, it's like blowing against a piece of glass and, 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 and the vapor just kind of expands and then all of a sudden it disappears. That's how life is. And that's why we got to come to the point where we learn how to cherish life and take advantage and appreciate every moment because you only have one moment to the next. It used to be said we live, we live day by day. No, we live breath by breath. Because every one of us only one breath away from death. One breath away. We don't live from day to day. We live from breath to breath. So I want to suggest to you that, that we ought to not have this spirit of complaint. In fact, uh, in Numbers, the 14th chapter, somewhere around verses uh, 26 to 36, read it in your own uh, time of leisure or convenience. The Bible says that when you read chapter one, uh, ch uh, verse one of chapter 14 in Numbers, God commands Moses to take the people and to go spy out the land. And they go spy out the land that God has promised to give them. And instead of appreciating and, and looking back over their lives and being mindful of all the things that God had already brought them through, being mindful of the fact that he brought them out of slavery, being mindful of the fact that he had brought them through the wilderness, being mindful of the fact that he had provided for them manna and quail, being mindful of all the miracles, all the plagues that he had brought them through. I mean, literally the Red Sea. And now he tells them to spy the land. Destroy Pharaoh and his chariots and all his army for them. And here they are now ready to embark upon God's promise for them. And he says, go spy the land. Not because he had not already did. He said that I've given them. Notice that. When you go back and read, he says, he, he says, raise up. He said, get a leader from every tribe. Let them go examine the land that I have given them. 
Now, my understanding means, or uh, my understanding of giving them is that's past tense. That is to say that if God has given it to you, it's not like you got to go do anything extra to get it. He says, I just want to show you what I got in store for you. He said when they went there and they saw the giants, they came back and 10 of them came back complaining. And watch this, there was over, there was a person at that time in their life, there was at least 2 million people in the camp of Israel. And 10 people caused the whole camp to go crazy. 10 people, 12 people go spout the land, two come back and say, we can do it. But 10 people say, we can't take it. There's giants in the land. Yeah. And watch what they said. They said, not only are they giants, not only are they bigger than us, See, that was a problem. They said they're bigger than us, but they fail to realize they're not bigger than God. And too often in life, we find ourselves complaining and taking certain things for granted, even the possibilities and the potentials that lie before us because we see things that are bigger than us. But you ought to always remind yourself as a child of God, I don't care how big it is, it's never bigger than your God. They said we look like grasshoppers in our own sight. That was the problem. They had bad perception. But I stopped by to tell somebody, just because it's your perception doesn't necessarily mean it's a reality. Amen. Because perception is how you view things. And, and let me just help some. Here, here's what I'm telling you. You ought to alter, way you, alter the way you view things, and you ought to view things and see things from the perspective that God has promised them. They said, we can't do it. And so they dwelt and died in the wilderness. Not only that, but when God chastises them and God speaks to Moses, God says, why are they complaining against me? Go read it for yourself. He said, why are these people complaining against me? Moses was the leader, but God says they began to complain about they couldn't take the land. God says, why are they complaining against me? The same thing they did in Mark the sixth chapter. They began to complain against Jesus, and the Bible says Jesus couldn't do many mighty works because the people start criticizing and they start complaining. And some of us just got the bad habit of always complaining about everything. Right. You can have a thousand dollars in your pocket and you complain because you don't have two thousand. It could be it could be sunshine outside, and, and and we complain about it. I mean, they just complain, and God called it. Not only did He say, "Why are they complaining about me?" and ask the question, but then He says, "He says they're complaining is evil." Yeah. Complaining to God is evil. Why is it evil? Because God has been too good to us. When you look at where we are in this country called America, the poorest people in this country are rich compared to all the people around the world. And here we are complaining about everything. But I stop by to tell you, don't take the fact, don't take, don't take for granted the fact that you have shoved over your head. You could have been homeless. Right. Don't take, don't take for granted the fact that that you have that you're complaining about your health and your strength because there's somebody's a whole lot worse off than you are. So don't take for granted that, that you have a, 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 what you call insufficient food supply in your house. Because there are some folks going to have any food. That's right. There are people starving across this country. We have a tendency to say things at times. We say, you know, I'm starving. We, we don't know what it means to starve. And what we have to do, we got to realize that life is but a vapor. We only have a short period of time here. We need to make good use of it and not criticize and not complain. Why? Because complaining is evil to God. Now look at verse four, and I'm going to try to wrap this thing up. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his home town and among his relatives and his own family. So we talked about the spirit of criticism, three spirits or attitudes that are exhibited. When we take life for granted, I take someone else for granted. The spirit of criticism, the spirit of complaining, but then notice this, the spirit of arrogance. One of the reasons they criticized Jesus and one of the reasons they complained against him is because they were arrogant. 
they saw or thought they were bigger than him. You see, to be arrogant is to have an unhealthy, exaggerated, unpleasantly proud sense of one's own self-worth or importance. Let me read that again. To be arrogant is to have an unhealthy, exaggerated, and unpleasantly proud sense of one's own self-worth or importance. And, and whenever there's arrogance in the land, America, proud America, you know, we talk about how proud we are as Americans. We talk about how great we are, how mighty we are as a nation. But one little journey has brought us all down. Yeah. Think about that. God didn't have to send an army of locusts against us. And here we are now, quarantine. Here we are now. People are trying to go back to work early. We want to go back to worship early. Why? Because we've taken all these things for granted. We've literally taken for granted and made the foolish presumption and assumption that, that we will always have what we have. And within a moment's notice, it was gone. Thousands of lives have passed on as a result of COVID-19. Many of those people made the assumption they would be here the next day. Man. That's arrogance. If I go back to James, the fourth chapter, and I told you to go to James, and James not only talks about how life is a, is a vapor, but he says, for those of us who have the audacity to say in arrogance, tomorrow I will do this. Yeah. Tomorrow I'm going here. Next year yeah. I'm gonna go do this. Yeah. And he says, he says, you don't even know what your life is. You don't even know if you're gonna have the next moment. Right. He says, all such boasting is evil. Why? Because it's arrogance to say. He said, here's he said, here's what y'all do. Y'all say, if the Lord's willing, right. if the Lord permits me, right. I'll do this. Or I'll do that. But to have the audacity. To say, I'll see you next week. Well, you don't know if next week is going to be on your calendar or not from God's perspective. That's arrogance. To say it in five years, and it's not suggesting we don't plan. It's not suggesting we don't make plans. But he's saying, in essence, don't ever take the mindset that you just know you're going to be here and you just know something's going to happen. He says, your life is a vapor. And just like the rich man, I think in Luke's gospel, the rich man had it all. Lazarus had nothing. But then they both died. You know what's an equal denominator among humans? We all die. Care how much money you got, I don't care what kind of house you live in, I don't care what kind of vehicle you drive. We all die. And this virus has proven yes. that the wealthy can be infected and affected as a result, regardless of their wealth. The poor, the rich, the white, the black, the Hispanic. Right. It does not discriminate. Right. So often in life, we take for granted the things that God has given us. And we just assume you got a lot of people who have never understood what it means to be poor. That are now... In this, in this nation alone, thousands and thousands and thousands of people have signed up for unemployment. And thousands are still waiting to receive it. Why? Because they just assumed they would always have a paycheck coming in. Right. It's been said that uh, at least 80 to 85% of all Americans are up to their ears in debt. But you know why? Because we buy all this stuff and we just assume that I paid off in the next five years. And now here we are with no money coming in. And that little stimulus check of 1200 or 2400 what anybody may have gotten, that ain't going to pay your bills. Don't take life for granted. And I think one of the reasons God has allowed this to happen to us and around this globe, because we make the terrible, tragic assumption that tomorrow is always promised and tomorrow will always be better. But he said, James said, you better say that if the Lord wills, right. if the Lord wills, things will get better. If the Lord wills, I'll prosper. If the Lord wills, I'll be here. If the Lord wills, I'll do this, that, or the other. 
It's arrogance to say with, with, with personal confidence of not knowing what God's plan and purpose is for you. To say, I know I do this. So we looked at the spirit of criticism, the spirit of complaining, the spirit of uh, arrogance. I want you to notice the consequences for taking God for granted. Going back to this text, and because of their unbelief in verse five, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Notice this, Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Think about that. The scripture says Jesus was amazed at the unbelief of the people who knew him. How many of us have known Jesus for a while? And yet we still exhibit paramount unbelief on a regular basis. We have a tendency to walk in fear and not by faith. The consequences of taking God for granted oftentimes shows up in our health. He says he could not do any mighty works because of their unbelief. And I want to suggest y'all do not take your mobility for granted. Some of you all heard my story that, you know, 2018, March the 12th, 2018, I was in a tragic or terrible accident and 100% uh, spinal injury, paralyzed temporarily, still trying to recover over two years later. But I thank God every day. And I've always been grateful for waking up in the morning. I've always thanked God for a place to stay. But it's different when you lose your mobility. Because every time I put my foot on the floor now, it's different than when it was before I had the accident. There, 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 there's something different about it because, because I'm always reminded of the times when I was paralyzed for that temporary time, when I, when I, when I couldn't get up on my own, when somebody had to pick me up and put me in a wheelchair. So, so now when I say thank you, it's just not out of ritualism because I'm reminded that it could be a whole lot worse. Don't, don't take your mobility. Don't, don't take your spouse and your family for granted because there are people now who are who are literally complaining because they can't get to their families. There are funerals that are taking place and their family members can't even be there to help celebrate their home. But don't take it for granted. Don't take God's blessings for granted. Don't take the fact that God woke you up this morning for granted. You didn't have to wake up this morning. You could have been dead and gone, but thanks be to God that he spared you one more time. Don't take for granted that God has provided you with shelter and food and clothing to put on your body. Don't take for granted that you got, you may not have a house that you want to live in like you are, but if you got shelter over your head, I stopped by to tell you, you got a reason to praise him. Don't take for granted that God has protected you because if the enemy had his way, he would have taken you out a long time ago. But thanks be to God, he has dispatched angels on your behalf and they stood before you and death and you don't even know it. I stopped by to tell somebody, you better praise him today. You better learn how to lift up holy hands. You better learn how to say in the midst of the storm, Lord, I thank you because you're still worthy to be praised. You better learn how to bless his holy name. Yeah, I know we quote that scripture in Psalm 34 and 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. But when all times show up in your life, when the good show up, you ought to bless him. When the bad shows up, you ought to bless him. When it hurts, you ought to a blessing. When it's painful, you ought to bless him. When folk walk out of your life, you ought to bless him. When he sends folk into your life, you ought to, at all times, I will bless the Lord. And his praise. What does praise mean? I will boast on him. James said, don't be arrogant. Don't you be boasting about what you're going to do. You better start boasting about what God is able to do. You ought to boast about the fact that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask. Think our man. You ought to boast about the fact that he's God and with a word, he can change your situation. You ought to boast about the fact that if he just speaks, death will behave. And if he speaks, death will show up. You ought to boast about the fact that he is God. You ought to boast about the fact that one day, some 2,100 years ago, he died on a rugged cross. You ought to boast about the fact that he was buried in your place. You ought to boast about the fact that he rose on your behalf. You ought to boast about the fact that right now, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father, interceding on your behalf. You ought to boast about it. 
You ought to boast about the fact that he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. You ought to boast about the fact that God will take care of you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Is there a living witness by way of this virtual worship service that you can say in your home or your bedroom, in your kitchen, wherever you are, that I know that God will take care of me? Can you lift up holy hands and say, Lord, on this Sunday morning, I may not be able to go out, but I'm glad that I've got a place to be quarantined in. I'm so grateful that I've got a place to be quarantined. I'm glad that that if I can't go certain places, at least I got a right mind. And I'm sane enough to know that I can't go certain places. I could have been crazy. I could have lost my mind, but by the grace of God. So I learned, my brothers and sisters, that in all things, give God thanks. In all things, bless his holy name. In all things, worship him in spirit and in truth. And don't take life for granted. Yeah. If he wakes up in the morning, when he wakes up, as soon as your eyes blink, even before your feet touch the floor, you ought to just lay there and say, Lord, I thank you. When you look at your family and you realize that things are as well as they are, even if they're not where you want them to be, Lord, say, thank you that I got a family. When you look at your finances and your bank account may be depleted through this uh, 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 of this pandemic, but thank God you still got a bank account. Thank you, God. We've got so much to be thankful for. And we spend too much time complaining and criticizing others and being arrogant as if tomorrow is promised and failing to realize their consequences. Jesus said, I couldn't do mighty works. That is to say, as I close, that Jesus wanted to do some mighty works, but because of their unbelief. And I want to share with you, my brothers and sisters, don't you stop believing. I don't care where you find yourself in life. You got to really believe that God will yes. turn this thing around. Yes. You got to believe that there's no trial, no trouble, yes. or no test that you can go through. That's too big for your God to handle. You got to believe with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength that no matter how bad and excruciating the pain is, God is able to take the pain away. You got to believe that no matter how lonely you are, he's a friend in the midnight hour. You got to believe that despite your situation, he will provide for you. He will make a way out of you. He will make a way for you. You got to believe it in your heart. And when you believe, the Bible says he won't just heal. He's here to do a mighty work. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I want God to do a mighty work in my life. I don't just want physical healing. I want him to work miracles in my life. I want him to do something greater than I could have ever thought or I could have ever met. I want a mighty work. And I wish two or three of you, wherever you are, would just say to yourself and those that are around you, I'm looking for a mighty work. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. And I'm going to keep on believing until it knocks on my door. I'm going to keep on believing yeah. until I see what is promised. I'm going to keep on believing. Until I can touch him and say, Lord, I thank you. But keep on believing until I stand before him in that great and, and beautiful day when I fall prostrate before him and say, Lord, I thank you for my salvation. I'm going to keep on believing. So let the storm freeze. Let the winds blow. Let, 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 the, let the, the, the waters and the waves beat against the ship of my house. But I'm going to keep on believing because he's worthy to be praised. I stop by the tell you today. Don't take it for granted. Don't take God for granted. Don't take your family for granted. Don't take your situation for granted. Don't take your breath for granted. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. And here's why this is so necessary. Because as this nation begins to open up and the world begins to open back up, don't forget what you've come out of. Because the next time it will be worse. Oftentimes when Jesus would heal somebody, he would tell them, go and sin no more. Yeah. Lest a worse thing will come up on you. Better be grateful. Amen. 